the meeting to order. Um, and any changes to the agenda? I, I have one that I want to make, which is to pull the. Well, I think we can probably get through the first few items before I go. So, no, I don't have any changes. Anyone else? Uh, the only thing I'll add is we, I forgot we didn't have a quorum at the last meeting, mm -hmm. so we still have to approve the January 22nd minutes. Yes. So we'll have to add that to the end. Okay. So for item 9, we'll say consider minutes from February 2nd and January 22nd. Sounds yep. good to me. Okay. Hearing no other changes, we'll deem the agenda approved with those amendments. Um, number three is comments from the chair. And my comments are that I, I need to leave the meeting early tonight. Kirby has agreed to run it. Um, but it's, it's nothing personal. I just have other conflicts going on tonight. Um, uh, and then the other piece I kind of want to mention is we are um, gearing up to move forward with a new city plan. And it will be interesting to see if we get new direction based on a new council. Uh, but for the time being, my understanding is that we should just keep moving forward with this. And then if policy changes need to come, they'll come. We're not far enough down the road for us to really have any policy that needs to be changed. So I don't really see any issue. Um, so I just wanted to make that note. Um, so that's, that's all I have for comments. Item four is general business, and that's intended to cover anything from members of the public that have it, topics that aren't already on the agenda, if they want to come up and provide general comments. We don't have anyone from the public here tonight, so we can move forward. Could we ask Jim Libby back for another lecture? <laughs> we could. <laughs> we'll try it next week. We could. Um, so then item five is welcome to the new commissioners. Yay. We're so excited to have you both on our team now. Um, it's great. We haven't had, we, we've had one or new two new commissioners in the past couple of years, but it's been one at a time. It's really exciting to have a couple new on. Um, obviously, we're going to miss what the, the prior commissioners brought to the table. They, they brought a lot of great insight and productivity, and I know that we're going to get new skills and new productivity and I'm, I think it's always really healthy for committees to have turnover so I think this is great and maybe as part of this item we could go around and introduce ourselves um, first before you introduce yourselves and you can say your name when you join the commission and if you want to indicate you know, the area and town where you live feel free. Want to start John? I'm John Adams. How long have I joined the planning <laughs> commission at the same time as you did? So I'm going to look to you for uh, what two, two years, three years, two, three years ago, two, maybe? Three yeah, years roughly. Ago. And I live. Uh, I was hoping you would say it first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I live uh, adjacent to the middle school. I'm Leslie Welts. I have been on the commission the same time as John, the same amount of time as John. Are you going to disclose what time that was? <laughs> it was, I know it's in August because I'm August. up for a reappointment every, every two years in August, although that might change with the charter changes. Um, I think it was starting in 2014? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Could be. So we jumped in and we thought we were about to approve the zoning at that point. <laughs> we were a month away. <laughs> right around the corner. So, yeah. Um, and I live uh, in the, the Brooklyn area a month later on the other side of the river um, on Prospect Street. We just, we haven't come up with a good nickname for that neighborhood yet. So. No, I think that works. <laughs> I'm Mike Miller. I'm the planning director downstairs. Um, so I will help to staff the planning commission and help to keep things, um, try to do some of the work that needs to get done for you guys. And I've been here since maybe 2014, maybe 2013. So going on four years. Yeah, you were just a few months before we came on, is that right? Yeah, 
Might be. So we were, so I've been, I was at the city of Barrie before I was here. I was there for five years, so. Um, but I don't live in town. I actually live out in Hardwick, so. Um, it's, it's good to have some separation from work. Yeah, it's nice to have a little bit of dis <laughs> distance there. Um, so my background is actually natural resource planning, although I spent most of my time doing city planning and more downtown and economic stuff than doing anything with natural resources. But it's good. It's fun. I didn't know that. Well, he's a certified flood manager. Yep. Flood flood manager. Well, anyway, we're going to talk about that soon, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I almost talked about it last week. We were like watching our basement to see if it was going to flood. Uh, so. I live on Elm Street on the river, oh, so. Cool. Um, the basement flooded in January, right? It so. did, yeah. And we still haven't replaced our hot water heater that was down there. Um, but it's nice to, nice to have these experiences for this, uh, for this committee. <laughs> so I'm Kirby Keaton. I joined about a year and a half ago. Um, and so with the two of you joining, I'm no longer the rookie. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, congratulations <laughs> to each of you. Um, and yeah, we're looking forward to, as Leslie said, we're looking forward to a new energy and, and new set of skills to contribute. Um, uh, my background is uh, I'm an attorney for the Department of Taxes. I uh, work on a variety of taxes there. Um, and some of them relate to this through land use and property taxes and that kind of stuff. I draw off of it a little bit. Um, I'm also a representative for the Regional Planning Commission. Uh, but that could change, and if either of you are interested, we, that's something we could ceremoniously hand off to. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of acquired it because I was the rookie, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, that's something to think about. What happened if you miss a meeting? Did I miss a meeting? Is that what no. happened? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's why you got avoided. Oh. That's what I didn't even know that. I didn't know it was like decided when I was there. Yeah. yeah. Plus studying your resume. Right, right, yes. right. Uh, I think that Kim became an alternate because he was missing a meeting it was before I joined. I was an alternate. I alternated so much I only went once. <laughs> That's why you received, I'm, I'm officially you received the, the packet. Right now. Yeah. yeah. But they, they did have his address on their records. Which they With your name, something. so. Yeah. That got corrected, by the way. It. I'm Kim Cheney. I live up around the Main Street corner on Town Street. And I guess I'm retired, but I can't quite figure out whether I have or not. <coughs> it's been a career chasing cops and robbers and joining them sometimes. <laughs> Mainly litigation. I think I've been here since 2011. I was here before Michael. <coughs> In fact, I helped Michael get his job. <laughs> but as I look around the table, I guess uh, looks like I'm the most senior whole survivor of the, yeah. of the great uh, zoning. So you won't have to do that again. That was fascinating work, but awful hard work. Well, thank you. It's it's really important. I mean, you could have new energy, but it's really important to have the continuity that you provide. And well, it's an interesting how. Things evolve. Obviously, we're a political institution, and uh, you start out think you're going someplace, and then something changes, and you're going someplace else. So it requires a bit of uh, uh, adaptability, shall I say, as well as the exchange of opinion on this group has always been respectful and perplexing at times. <laughs> But it's very helpful. It's been a lot of fun. And, uh, be 
people can always say what they want to say. And we encourage them to do it. And we figure out whether we agree with them later. In regard to public comments, you mean? I mean yeah. Any debate right. that comes yeah. up here. Sunset Avenue. I'm not sure we have a name for our neighborhood either. <laughs> um, and I work at the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, so I have a master's in planning, but I've never worked in planning, so um, I'm really excited to <laughs> really learn planning on the, um, you know, the more detailed level. So, yeah, but I'm yeah working with work the housing sector for a long time. Well, I'm Stephanie Smith. I work for the state. I'm the housing migration planner at Vermont Emergency Management. Preservation and regional energy plans. Exciting. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks So, next up on the agenda is the update on historic preservation and between Barb and Kim. Kim is here. Well, Barb and I went to the meeting the 12th, I believe it was. Um, what's going on is a whole rejuvenation of the idea of historic preservation planning in the city. <clears throat> and I think it had fallen on kind of inaction over the last several years. So I was excited this this group is interested and interesting and they they're um, very committed to developing a plan for the city. Um, I think you may not know this, but I think you do, that um, we had a little bit of a controversy a year or so ago up with an area up, up behind the um, State House, or in that area anyhow, which to my view was a historic development, and some people in those, that neighborhood wanted not to be in it because they felt the regulations were too burdensome. And uh, in the zoning effort, we made an effort to change the regulations so that contemporary materials could be used under a certain guidance. But then in historic preservation people didn't like that. Uh, I don't think they're against contemporary materials, but they were, they wanted a design component that worked on it. And I think there's very low awareness of historic preservation at the moment. What it means to the city and what it does. And, um, but I think the new uh, commission is going to be active and we'll be following them. And they very much want our involvement, so. So, sorry, I don't know this, but this is a historic preservation commission that's been formed in yeah, by the design review board, or by the city. By the by the city. By the city. city. Advise the design There's review There's been a district? historic <coughs> preservation commission for years. It's just been pretty inactive. Oh, okay. And given the whole conflict over design review criteria and who should be reviewed and who shouldn't be reviewed. Um, but there was a lot of controversy about that. And so we got a fresh start. The, uh, the people who wanted out of design review are now out. Um, but I think it's an open-ended question as to whether whether new regulations will be more palatable and whether the city will want to expand areas. So the, the design review standards were part of the regulation, the um, zoning ordinance we were looking at 
and then we ended up just kind of separating that out and not settling that piece when we passed zoning. So this committee's looking at a way to to create new design review standards with kind of looking for the goals that the Planning Commission had kind of voiced before, which are a little bit more flexible, easier to apply. Um, currently, our standards are kind of vague, as I understand it. Is that right? Yeah, they tend to be vague. So we want more specific standards for people to follow, but also with some flexibility, especially on building materials and things. Windows was a big thing that came up. So we'll be having this relationship with the uh, pre uh, preservation committee that's working on this, where eventually it would be the planning commission to act on whatever recommendations they end up producing for us. So Kim and Barb have been tending to kind of get to know their process better. Um, I personally have a lot to learn about slope preservation. You have I have a lot to learn about it. Um, but that's something that's down the road that we're going to, we'll end up maybe acting on these design review standards and pass them on the city council for a vote. Well, as I was driving down uh, East State Street, saying, would you rather look at this scene or would you rather look at the development on Barry Street? And if so, what is a new building and what's going on? It's, uh, they're, they're not mutually exclusive, obviously, but there are things that give this city real character, and historic preservation is designed to trying to uh, preserve them. It also has money to help people, so it isn't just to do what I say. <laughs> there are grants and there's assistance. But I think it'll be um, one of the things um, I've been asking them to do, and I don't know where they are on it, is develop a slideshow of buildings and neighborhoods in the area and why they are or are not in historic preservation. And uh, my great mentor, history of art teacher, Binding lectures where he would take you from the pyramids to Frank Lloyd Wright, complete with music of the periods, <laughs> and try to get an idea of what was going on in the world. This historic preservation isn't just about the past, it's about our sense of place and who we are and what we value. And it's a complicated and very subjective business. So. So the, the Cliff Street neighborhood that you mentioned, just to, to fill these guys in on, um, so they they lobbied the city council to be removed from the historic preservation area and, and were successful. So Cliff Street's not part of it anymore. But one thing, so kind of along those lines, another thing we can look at besides the design review standards is to look at whether or not the, complete, the current footprint of what the historic preservation area, uh, if that's really what it, what Montpelier wants it to be, or if it should be something different, especially in light of the fact that there was a recent change with Cliff Street being taken out. If that is, is that is that symbolic of a of a policy shift for the city council to want to make it smaller, or was it really just the folks who live in that neighborhood were just successful lobbyists for themselves? Um, and the boundary doesn't make a lot of sense right now. It's just kind of. You know, it doesn't follow any logical boundary. It was just kind of dropped out there. It doesn't follow the National Historic Register District. It doesn't follow any zoning district lines. It just kind of plunks in there. Some historic areas, some not historic areas. So you've got these rules that apply to not historic areas. So, you know, one of the questions is, you know, let's find out what we want to try to do. And maybe some areas will be removed, like National Life. Um, which isn't historic, but has to meet historic standards, you're left with these odd places like that. So, And then other places like East State Street that you would think would be in the, d the design review district isn't. So a lot of people have commented, you know, why, 
why Cedar Street could be allowed to be allowed to happen. It's like, well, even though it's really close to downtown, it wasn't in design review, and that's why that project was able to be built without any design review. So, just some questions that they've got, you know, they've got a they've got a tough job because we put together a proposal that the community rejected. So we know they're going to have a tough job coming up with a proposal and talking it through with the public and educating the public. And, and they have a consultant right now that's helping them get started? Uh, they're, yeah, they're thing. working with um, Landworks out of Middlebury. I think it's uh, on the regulations, the design regulation. To me, this is not a technical problem, it's a political problem. <coughs> and the technical part is obviously follows the politics, but I don't know anything about Cliff Street except driving up there and take a look at it, and I urge you both to do that. It's an absolute gem of a little neighborhood. That's oh, beautiful. It's just, it's just an amazing little place. Mm -hmm. And so the whole issue of regulation what people can do with their own property is clearly a, a lightning rod issue, but you'll have fun working on it. Did they get in the weeds at all in this meeting? The, la the last meeting you attended, that would, had they started the process? Had they worked well, no, with the they were, they, they were competently getting organized. They were getting committees and putting on who was going to do what, and there's com Complete unanimity that historic preservation presence in the city has really suffered. And they'll do some walk arounds and they'll get some people to, to know about why we are as we are and try to explain it to people and see if they see the value in helping preserve it. So I was impressed. I think they're energetic. And I have Sarah McShane, Mike's assistant, who is a real tiger. So that's helpful. Did we have anything else on historic preservation? Okay. Yeah. I think the follow up on that, they had another organization meeting, and I'm waiting to see if they. Had they haven't really got in the policy very much. They're trying to get organized and figure out what they're going to do. And we'll follow up. The they want us involved because they know it's going to end up here sometime. Would it help if we had some general discussions about the policy input? Like, I think it's premature. Okay. I think I want to let them do their homework. So you're thinking they would get a draft together of some kind, not necessarily a draft, but some thoughts together, report to us is the first step, rather than us report? I don't think they need anything on paper right away. I think what we need is an assessment of what's in the city, what's worth preserving, why, what difference it makes to people. I mean, uh, it's hard to say, but I get enormous pleasure out of going down State Street. I just like looking at looking at it. And I, the city would be very different if anybody could do it. Just destroy the, the past. Um, so I think the first thing is to get some introduction into what is historic preservation and why do we why are we concerned about it. I don't think we're in any drafting part yet. When I meant when I meant draft, it was just it's like a proxy for just I'd like who to reports see the, to whom first is kind of the I'd question. I'd like to see the slideshow of what they think is important and why it's worth saving. And I'd like as soon as they get that ready, I'd like them to come here and we'll put it out to the city and um, at least that's my agenda. They may have a completely different agenda. I know their grant goes through August, so I don't know they're trying to 
they've got a certain benchmarks that they're trying to meet in the next five, six months to try to get through. So. And by August, they plan to have uh, at least the, the frame. Well, they're going to have standards, but what they want to be able to do is to pull together the standards and the boundary and have kind of a, a direction that they want to go. So that way, in the fall, they can apply for some funding to actually do. Um, I don't know if you were here when we did them, but we had um, design workbooks. Yeah. That one of the designs. That, uh, I think I was here. Because uh, Brandy came in, she took a um, couple of them from around the country, where people, different communities, you have a set of standards, and then you have these design. Are the pattern books? Pattern books. And so they want to be able to put together a pattern book, but you that's kind of a, a step two. Step one is what are your standards? What are we trying to accomplish? Where do we want to try to enforce this and go out to the public and go out and make sure we get feedback? It really can't be adopted until we have this pattern book that we go through and start to really illustrate and give that detailed guidance it to the DRC. It seems to me that the Planning Commission and the residents of Montpelier and the, and the City Council should all probably weigh in before standards are written, so well before August comes around, so that what we don't end up with is a set of standards that are written in a vacuum and then is kind of rejected by the community. Well, they're going to be going to the community with them. They're going to kind of be doing, they've got uh, three meetings, three public meetings, plus a couple other input pieces that they have to try to go through and, and vet these ideas um, okay. and concept. So that's the process. Yeah, they won't be, they won't be, yeah, they won't be debating the actual words of the, the standards probably with the public until they get to the end. Um, because what they really want to do is to talk about the ideas and concepts. What is it you guys are willing to accept and then we'll write the rules to implement that. Mike, could you ask Shelburne to send us about six copies of their book? I had one which I gave to Kirby, but I think it's, that was the most impressive. Did you mean to bring that back to you? No. Okay. No. I don't think you tried but to get If you could ask them if they could send us some, I, I think it's I could probably really print copy. some out. They're probably something I can download. I don't need a paper copy if you're... Yeah. Are the public meetings coming up, or how did they're, they're meeting tomorrow as subcommittee, so they've got a subcommittee who's working on um, starting to, to look at other communities' standards, <laughs> so they can start to just look what other oh, countries Yeah, I meant do. the ones then, yeah. the where they're soliciting input. But yeah. those, they're just going to be their regular meetings. They're going to be soliciting input at some of them, you're saying? Uh, they're going to have actual um, public input meetings that they're oh. going to set up for ones here. I think they're going to try to get at the senior center. Um, but the, they're meeting in subcommittees. One is working on the rules. The other one is meeting on when those public input meetings will be and how to get topics. So that should be coming out. So. We'll probably be following up on that and meetings in the short term then. Well, the next item on the agenda is a report from me, which is uh, pretty short. Um, from the So what's going on at the Regional Planning Commission right now is uh, there's a regional energy plan that's been discussed and it's being noticed for a public hearing. Uh, so those hearings are coming up at the next uh, couple of Regional Planning Commission meetings. Uh, we had a kind of a first reading at the last meeting uh, last Tuesday uh, in which there was a significant change from the draft that had come out of the Energy Subcommittee of the Regional Planning Commission and what was before us at the last meeting. And so a little bit of controversy came out because uh, some staff of the Regional Planning Commission uh, made a substantive change and the change that was made was that this this the energy subcommittee had wanted to put a ban on industrial wind for the region so for all towns and in, in central region 
uh, and what, what the ban on industrial wind meant was that uh, it wasn't going to allow uh, any towers that were more than 100 feet from the stem part of the tower. Um, so, so nothing higher than that would be allowed anywhere. Um, the, the reason for that is that looking at the ridges that exist in our region, uh, they didn't think any of them were appropriate for something that size, and then anything kind of off the ridges lower didn't need to be that size. Um, so that's kind of that. That was what the, you know, the subcommittee thought it was agreeing on, and thought it was passing along. Staff looked at something that came from the Department of um, Public Service that made them believe that if you ban wind towers of 100 feet or more, then you're also banning all other buildings of 100 feet or more. And they went ahead and just changed the ban on industrial wind to say that, um, to, basic, to basically wipe out the meaning and to, it, would allow, it would allow, well, like wind towers much bigger than 100 feet. Um, so there's some drama over the folks who wanted the, the ban and, and being caught off guard by that. Uh, and the resolution was that at the next meeting, staff will restore the original language and we'll get some further written input from the Department of Public Service at the next, at the next meeting. Uh, so that, that's, that's going to continue to be debated and if anyone from the public shows up, which I haven't seen so far, they'll, they'll be able to comment on that. But that's, that's the biggest thing there. And the only other really big policy issue within the Regional Energy Plan is there's some analysis of conflicts between local plans and the regional plan, and it, um, the plan kind of goes through the process for all of that, which I guess is kind of a novel thing. It hasn't been done before. I went through it. I didn't see any issues. It all seemed like common sense, um, such as if something has regional significance, and it, then the regional plan tends to, to have the more have more weight. And if there's a con if there's a conflict. If something's really specific to a municipality, then it's, then its plan would be able to contradict something that's in the regional plan. Um, but but anyone who's interested in, in learning more about any of that stuff it can go to the regional planning commission's website and look at the proposed energy plan. And I think it's been like 80 pages. And I believe I shared it with other folks. Um, I can I can actually forward that email to the two of you. Um, do we have their emails? Yes. Yeah. Should be a part of the email when that went out. The latest one? Great. And is the regional energy plan binding? I mean, about wind towers? Does it have some, I guess I'm. It, the, <laughs> the, the biggest point to having it is uh, that the, uh, uh, what's the name of the? Section 248. Yeah, they'll get deference in front of the public service The public board. service board yeah. is. It, that, so that the regional energy plan would get deference. Other, otherwise, if there's not if there's not an energy plan, then comments from the RPC would just be yeah, disregarded or, or it would have weight. Is there any other yeah. place in the state where there's such a limitation? Yeah, there's. From what I was told from uh, other members of the regional planning commission, the other region regional uh, planning commissions that have this uh, have also banned wind in a similar way. And so, so now they've created this sort of domino effect of everyone's scared that they're going to be the only ones that don't ban it so that they'll be the mecca for industrial wind, which I don't know if that's necessarily true, but. It's really just disappointing, you know, that it hasn't come out that it's more of a, a system of trying to find out where it would be mm -hmm. and how it would be appropriate because I mean when it when these things come up for votes they pass by overwhelming amounts. I mean, there's a handful of very vocal people who don't like wind towers and you know the Lowell Wind Project for all the grief it gets when it was put to a vote was 85 percent in favor of it mm -hmm. because they don't pay municipal taxes anymore. I mean that's you, you want amazing. lower taxes, you know, put up, you, if, you, if you have some wind tower sites, you know, you know, they'll erase your municipal property taxes. But the regional plan also has some sites that are suggested for, or, or considered viable for smaller wind, 
um, and the, the quarries in Barry is something that came up as, as one of the best places in our region. Um, this is all regional planning commission staff that are deciding this stuff. Kind of a lot of it's on paper, I think, in looking at this. What about solar? Are the uh, plans say anything about that? It does, but nothing is exciting as bans on anything. Um, you know, they have goals for the future and what they want it to look like, and there was some debate about how many cars are we going to have in the region, which yeah. is what it is. Did you have something, John? Uh, I was just going to say, I don't think we have any suitable wind speeds anywhere in Mount Philly that uh, warrant one, one any discussion. Yeah, yeah. But part of it, part of the energy plan will allow for areas, preferential areas, to receive favorable um, rates for selling electricity back to the grid, so that's part of the other piece of why it matters aside from the difference in 248. Hmm. One interesting thing looking at the plan that I took away was that there's actually three solar installations in Montpelier that are of a decent size, which is compared to the surrounding towns is actually a decent number, which I was surprised to learn about. I don't think that one counts. The National Life one is new. That's the only one I. Well, lo Log Road is one. Log Road is up on um, Elm Street. Okay. There was an old gravel pit. That's where the city's our power um, um, 500 kW site is. Hmm. So I don't know where the third one is, though. But we should have to tell you. Something to, something to look up. It's it's looking like it's going to pass under the ban there, the ban, the ban on the show one's going to pass. Uh, there was some other, dis I mean, uh, there was some other discussion uh, at the meeting about some language in the plan that, that identifies residential development as um, making a large negative impact, um, like new residential development in forests or undeveloped areas, so like sprawl stuff was actually addressed as, as an energy issue there. And um, I found it interesting that the representative from Calus was kind of offended by the statement that new residential development is, is a bad thing. She thought that, I mean, she had the attitude of like living in the woods by herself is very back to nature and how, I mean, so there was, there was, a, little, a, there was a little bit of that. Um, and she said that she thought people in her town would be really offended by that, and she tried to, to have it removed. But all the other towns were like, "No, we we've, we've learned about this, and it does make a really bad negative impact." Sorry. So they're uh, defining that though, what that what they're considering sprawl versus. No, sprawl was my word. Okay. I mean, the, yeah, the language used it's in the plan was was just about. It was basically saying that that new residential development is the largest impact on. Um, yeah. As, as opposed to commercial or other types of uses, which, and that statement's made, I was interpreted to mean in the, kind of in the aggregate, because there's more of that development happening to kind of chop things up than other types of development. So, so what's the argument, Kirby? Why don't we want residential and uh, all that so on some out in the woods? Sure. I mean, well, there's so there's other conservation things besides energy, like like forest fragmentation, which is a big issue in Vermont right now. About there's a lot of questions about we have a lot of forest, but how much of it's high quality forest, and it's a lot less high quality forest, as in good for habitats and 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 things like that. So we don't have as much healthy forest because it's broken up by roads and development. Um, that's one thing. Uh, and also the automobile usage and you know commuting and like and those those impacts and things go to the energy part of it. So looking at um, all the designated centers in Vermont, so we have our downtowns, our growth centers. Um, if you compare vehicle miles traveled uh, from those within those centers to without, uh, inside the centers they drive about. Um, I think the median is about ten thousand uh, vehicle miles traveled a year compared to about. So less than half, they'll drive less than half as much. So that's not it. Mm -hmm. So if you're energy planning, yeah. you can plan for that much. You can get more housing close to de close to where you work and close to where you shop, then you can have less vehicle miles. Complete out of nowhere. 
Is there any discussion of the uh, deer population and the destruction of the forest? We've, yeah, we've, we've heard from Fish and Wildlife gave a presentation on forest fragmentation and, and the impacts there. Um, I don't know, I don't think they mentioned like deer specifically, but, um, but that was part of it with the wildlife habitat. Um, is part of it. No woods near yeah. my house. Nothing can grow in there. That forest will never regenerate itself. Any, any little twig is eaten down. So you get older trees and no, no young ones can survive. Mm. And that's my amateur forestry view. When I walk through the woods, there's absolutely no wonder story. It's all eaten. Maybe more unique to Montpelier than some other places. It's just that we don't have rifle season here. <laughs> <laughs> I saw deer running down there. Uh, Bailey next to the state house one, like one day recently. We're going down the street. <laughs> 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 um, and, uh, another thing that, that, that's come up is we've looked at um, some of the state's uh, maps and what they consider agricultural resource or, or you know, conservation resources, I mean. Um, and you look at Montpelier and you see, I mean, that it, there's not much that's been set aside. So the, the rivers are, are a focus for the state. Um, and juxtapose that with some of the towns surrounding us where I mean, it's like more than 90% green, like like priority for the state to conserve. Mm -hmm. uh, but even our own Hubbard Park isn't considered, it's just not big enough, I think, to be like a really, really valuable resource. So it's great for us for recreational purposes as residents, but it's not part of like the state's plans for um, you know, ecological stuff. That's that's kind of the last couple of meetings have been about. Well, thank you for attending those. A couple I went to, I thought a huge crowd of people is pretty unmanageable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trying to figure out what. It just my my view on the regional planning commission, by the way, is just as Montpelier's representative, is that I feel like it's for it's a resource. The regional commissions are resources for. The smaller towns that don't have a lot of staff, and I feel like it's a good place for us to have to bring a Montpelier kind of attitude of like, what can we do for the region? Which is kind of uh, is kind of my attitude about it, because um, be, alternatively you could look at it like as something like that as like, well, what does Montpelier get out of this? But like, I, I don't think of it as existing for that purpose, and um, I anticipate that. Uh, as we do more work here, that we might need to go talk to the Regional Planning Commission about maybe amending the regional plan and what it says for Montpelier um, to promote some of the things like for our um, zoning ordinance and, and where we want to kind of channel development and things. Yeah. Uh, because we're fi I think we're fine where we are, but, but as we want to encourage more development here, we might actually need to change the regional plan and we might need to have the conversation with the Regional Planning Commission that um, Montpelier sees itself as a place where more development needs to happen on a regional scale, which means possibly less other places. And it'll be interesting to see how other towns view that, because I think there is a tendency that no matter how small your town is, that's where you live and you want to see it like grow. Um, so anyway. I think during the um, economic development sort of plan or hearings, there's a lot of talk of support for regionalization of various services and I wonder if there's an opportunity in at least our plan update to get into that and uh, discuss with the regional planning commission and neighboring communities and are there opportunities I don't have any specific in mind or any mm -hmm. agenda there but it seems like it's worth that would be regional planning would be a logical place for well, one mm -hmm. of my other adventures is being on the board of the Central Mountain Regional Public Safety Authority, which probably very few in this room have heard of. But the idea is uh, to attempt, I mean, the long range vision would be have one uh, police, fire, uh, medical for Central Vermont. And 
outside of the various towns fighting each other for their budgets. But right now, it's all about dispatching, um, trying to get public safety services where they belong. And we'll be looking to work with the Regional Planning Commission to get some support for that, as you say, because, I mean, it's the key to good um, public safety is being able to get the equipment where it needs to be as quickly as you can get it. Everything appears to be working finally until it doesn't. Quebec taxi cabs jam our computer, uh, our circuits, so you may get an emergency and taxi cabs will take over. You can't even get information together. And we have two dispatchers centers, one in Mary and one in Montpelier. But there's no way for one to hear what the other's doing. So it takes a lot of improvisation to try to coordinate all this stuff. Um, that will require some new uh, uh, towers, one new tower, but more equipment. It, it'll be a major project if we pull it off. Okay, well, Mike, what do you have? Us on the city plan. So, uh, as Leslie mentioned with the city plan, so we just finished on January 3rd the zoning update. And on December 20th or 12th, we had readopted the master plan again. Um, what's called the master plan, what we're now calling the city plan. Um, so that was readopted just so we could have another window of time. We had to update a few pieces of information to get that going. So where we've been a little bit in, in kind of a little bit of a holding pattern is waiting to see what, what's up with the new council. Um, the current council, uh, the mayor and two of the councilors are not running so we're going to end up with at least three new persons. Um, so we'll see uh, what the new council would kind of like to give us for a direction to go. But we've said for a long time there, um, that we wanted to develop a new plan. There are a lot of um, people, there was a lot of effort that went into and a lot of visioning that went into developing this plan in 2009 and 2010. Um, when it was developed, a lot of input sessions, a lot of um, people came out um, where uh, a number of us felt it, it fell short was a little bit in, in developing strategies for how we're actually going to implement and reach our goals. So what we want to be able to do is um, kind of take this plane, which kind of threw everything into the soup, and kind of break it back out into some of its pieces and then write a plan for housing and write a plan for transportation and write a plan for energy because we have an energy committee that can help us with the energy plan. We have a transportation committee that can help basically be the person who's going to, people that are going to um, implement transportation plan and you know housing, we've got the housing task force. So we've got these committees, so we kind of want to break it up. We've got a committee, work with the committee, develop a plan, um, strategies, what we're going to be doing and um, kind of work in that, back in that vein to direct um, the plans going forward and then to really spend some time asking hard questions about how we're going to actually implement the plan. Um, the housing piece that I gave you that was there, that's, um, some of you have seen that before. That's what the housing committee kind of came up with as their implementation strategy. It was just more of a white paper format. It really wasn't anything that would be inserted into a plan, but it started to outline, you know, what were their aspirations, why why they thought that was a good goal or a good aspiration, what are some strategies, how would these strategies come together, um, and the goal really being, um, you know, s starting to have some of those questions, starting to get away from strategies like we want to encourage accessory apartments, 
encouraging accessory apartments doesn't make any accessory apartments. How are we going to encourage it? Are we going to develop a marketing strategy to to do it? Who's going to do that marketing strategy? Um, you know, are we going to have financial incentives? Are we going to do a plan to find out why people aren't making accessory apartments and to really start to, to come up with a strategy that the housing committee can work on with the community development specialist to really start to say, let's advance this. We've got money in a housing trust fund. We have a couple hundred thousand dollars that might be sitting um, in these kind of defunct revolving loan funds. Can we take those funds and reapply them to help to make housing happen? Um, and then the question is, okay, well, what is it we want to do and how can we best use these funds? Let's start lining up the train cars in such a way that we can start to take our resources, um, establish a goal, establish a program, and start to, to make housing, and then evaluate the program, see how well it works. So we've got different ways, and um, which we've talked about, of um, we can set policies, we can find out what we don't know and decide what we're going to plan for, we can change our zoning regulations and other rules. We just finished at the last meeting and the council did addressing the sprinkler ordinance. That was actually in the plan in a couple of places that said we should review that. Is the sprinkler ordinance a barrier to housing development? Um, and so that's been removed now um, from the sprinkler ordinance. There's not a requirement for single family homes and duplexes any longer. So. We want to start to do those kinds of things of identifying and evaluating and then kind of moving forward to, to start to implement. So that way we can look back in the eight year life of the plan to kind of start looking back and seeing are we making real progress? Um, because that's our goal is if, if we do all of these steps, are we going to start to accomplish our goals or start to advance our goals? And we really want to make sure we've got good, good strategies because Unlike a lot of places, it's it's difficult for a place like Callis or Woodbury to accomplish goals. They don't have staff. They've just got volunteers. They don't have a lot of resources. We do. We've got staff. We've got resources. We can write grants. I think we just need to do a better job of really um, asking hard questions of finding out what it is specifically we want to do and then um, start to pick a direction and start to go and start to evaluate how well we're doing and I think that's what we want to do we want to start with housing that was because they they're the farthest along I thought that would be a good one many members of the council I think are interested and many members of the public are interested in getting more housing and how can we make housing more affordable so I think that's a good first one to take but um, uh, it'll be interesting to see from the council whether they want to see you know, we want to see the entire plan rewritten in two years, um, you know, or whatever. Then then that means, well, we can't be quite as detailed on everything. We can, you know, kind of, kind of put together some framework of plans for all the ten chapters and then um, amend them later with more detail. But we thought we would, we would get one chapter done because we thought – if we got one done, we could use it as a model for others. And the hope is eventually we would have all these white papers for housing, let's say. But ultimately, we have to write six pages. You know, I think we had to calculate that as like 1,500 to 2,000 words or something like that. So really, you've got to digest all this down into your selling point. If somebody in the public opens our city plan to housing, that they can really understand housing in about six, six pages because we're going to have lots of chapters, so we really have to, you know, um, uh, really start to narrow that down and tell a good story, tell the story that we think we need to tell about housing. Um, and fortunately, we're not going to be doing all the work. Um, the committees are going to be doing a lot of the original heavy lifting. Certain chapters will be here, land use. You know, there's, there isn't another committee for land use. That's, that's going to be the planning commission, but... A lot of the other chapters um, already have committees that would be responsible for doing the, the, the initial work of the recreation, open space, natural resources, that's conservation commission. So that's
that's kind of where where I see it going, and I'm certainly open to your suggestions and ideas as well. Um, and we're also going to, as we said, see what happens in the next two weeks with council who gets appointed, what their goals and directions are. If they want to send us in a single direction, um, you know, we do have staff, but we've got only so much time. So if council says it's all about um, downtown economic development, then that may take away from some other working on the master plan. But they, but they, they may turn around and say, together, don't they? I mean, uh, you they do. You can't just pick one and say we fixed the others. Like, uh, who, who wrote this document? I wrote um, most of it and gave it to you know the housing committee and other folks to kind of. I I threw the stuff down as um, ideas for them to start to chew on. And when would we see, I like your idea of giving us a draft and saying, these are the goals, these are the implementation, this is the time frame, so far. Um, I think that's very different than the existing plan. I would love to you could develop one of those that we could look at so we know the methodology. And that's what we're going to be trying to do with the housing. Housing will be the first one that we'll try to work our way through. This was just one that we had started in 2016. Um, Leslie had asked that I bring a couple things just to go and kind of kick off what, what we're doing, what we've done. I mean, this is a much shorter version. This really just looked at, this was them when they wanted to put together their goals, policies, and recommendations that we started to talk about um, looking at the, the old plans that had existed back in, you know, this one from 2000. So we looked at the old plans, um, the regional plan, a number of other things started to pull ideas, you know, key words that we thought would be important started to pull them together. You know, do we want to have a single vision statement? Do we want to break it into, in this case, four? aspirations, um, you know, how did we want to structure it, and it's going to be an evolving process until we come up with one that we all think that kind of works. Well, my very quick read as you were speaking, for, please excuse me, but these, um, there's a lot of meat on the bone here, there's a lot of definition of issues and problems, but not a lot of discussion of how we get there. No, those there is some as you get later in the in the document. I didn't read enough. Yeah, far, farther in you actually get to where they list the aspiration and then the policies and goals oh, okay. that go along with it. Um, so the first one was, where do these aspirations come from? Why do we think these are appropriate to be aspirations? And then later it has a list of, but it doesn't really explain how or who or what. It was just here's a strategy, and here's one thing that we could do. Um, and hopefully, if we did the strategies, each strategy helps advance the goal. So if we did all the strategies, in theory, we would be helping to accomplish our goal. I think our new members might be interested in why this makes a difference to anybody to have a plan. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, the, the one we worked on for zoning really guided the zoning. That's not the primary thrust of the new plan. Maybe you could give us a quick review of what the plan. I know it's not regulatory, but it definitely has influence. Yeah, I mean it's a policy document. It's it's setting out the vision, and in a lot of ways, um, my background. You know, I spent eight, nine years working at the Regional Planning Commission, doing a lot of just writing master plans and com comprehensive plans. And um, one of the things, of course, when you're just at the Regional Commission is you don't really get the chance to implement those plans. And it was always disappointing to not see a lot come out of all that hard work, to actually see things change on the ground. Um, so I started just paying attention to places that I would see change and start to follow up on, all right, you know, you know, even little things, you know, what happened in, you know, little village of Groton. And you're like, well, you know, 
fixing up a post office and fixing up a couple of things, and suddenly you realize it's like, oh, none of that had anything to do with zoning or these other things. It really was, you know, about identifying a plan and doing projects. And so when I went to Barry and, and now, a lot of my focus is uh, zoning is always important, but zoning, zoning and your regulations, they're reactionary. They're not proactive. So a lot of what I try to do, and I'm kind of winging it and making it up as I go along, is to try to, to, to keep finding ways of being proactive about issues. So we want more housing, and we want more affordable housing. We can write all the zoning we want. But chances are good if we're going to implement it, it's going to get implemented through either a program or a project. Um, and really the only difference between those two is a program is something that's ongoing, where um, a project is something you do once. We do one, one Taylor Street. We have a first-time home buyer program. So the first-time home buyer program, every year we issue six first-time home buyers if we've got the funding available. And there's a purpose for that and a reason for that. And um, it's not just being done to be generous, it's being done because we have a specific outcome that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, we wanted to get more kids in the school. How can we get more kids in the school? We need more young families to move to Montpelier. How do we get more young families to move to Montpelier? We need to provide um, a matching funds to Down Street's first-time homebuyer program. So that's what we do to try to encourage young families to move to town. Um, Offering $10,000, each child that ends up in the school will be a, another block grant from the state for the school. It doesn't help the city, government, municipality, but it helps the school for each child that ends up in the school system. And I think over the years it's resulted in nine students that have stayed for a number of years. So for the amount of money that's spent, we've gotten far more than that. Um, and while you always hear on the radio of declining school enrollment, we don't have that in Montpelier. How much of that can we attribute to our first-time homebuyer program? I don't know, but it was certainly something that was a very specific concern that we came up with a specific program that we can actually document these students, you know, and how long they stayed and how much money we got as a result of the investment that we made in the first time homebuyer program, which we don't have to, we don't have to do, but I think it certainly would make it more challenging, especially with our high housing prices for us to get young families into town. So it's those types of things that I'm trying to do. How we make, how we actually write this, how we sell it to the public, this is, you know, I think, I think it's one of the things that I know I don't do as good a job at, um, and I know even just looking, watching the news and the amount of distrust that people, a lot of people have with the government, you know, I think we just need to do a better job of saying, you know, it's not, you know, it's not Ronald Reagan's <laughs> work, you know, the government is, isn't the solution to the problems, the government is the problem. Well, I think that mentality has been very cancerous because there's a lot of things that we can do and a lot of great things we do that help to fix a lot of the problems that are in, you know, as a result of just economics. So I think we need to do a better job of selling it. The, the city plan is a good place for us to do that. Our website, if we could tie this into the website, we could do a better job of explaining to people why we do what we do and why it's important. Um, and what the results are. And if people say we don't like these goals, then great, we don't need to do these implementation strategies. But if people say, yeah, affordable housing is important, we need to have this, then I'm going to do my best to say, all right, we're not just going to put in wishful thinking, we're not just going to encourage things. I'm going to try to do some homework and come up with proposals for people to consider to say, here's how we're going to do it. And we can say yes or no. I think that's a really great point. I think that's something that we can do while we're going through the process of coming up with a plan and coming up with things to actually act on to incorporate in the plan. Nothing's stopping us from going ahead and acting on some of them <laughs> right away. Oh, yeah. And going to city council with some of these things right away as we're, as we're contemplating for the plan. Um, yeah. And as we saw with the sprinkler 
ordinance was just something we would have put in here to reconsider it. It actually is, is in there because this was right. 2016. Well, it, it, got, says it got some momentum recently and we repealed it. And that was a barrier to, to developing housing in Montpelier. Uh, and the more that we can just get momentum and, and go ahead and get things done now, I think, yeah. So like, why put the work of putting into a plan when we can also do, put in the work and just get it done? Yes. Yep. And it, but it's important in the end to, to kind of be able to tie those back to a goal. Um, so we can go through and say, you know, this is why in the future we don't do similar things or why we, you know, why we don't make the same mistakes or why we do the same things as, you know. So, and that's our hope is to just go through and be able to say, here's the problem and here's how we can try to fix it. And, um, you know, as I said, it's always been a challenge, you know, the goals and policies here encourage housing development that means maintains and expand housing diversity. Um, you know that's a recommendation that's almost um, meaningless. Encourage adaptive reuse of existing buildings. These are a lot of the strategies that exist in, in not only Montpelier's plan but in a lot of plans around the state. And so we're just going to try to, or at least that's been my goal. So it's just to try to find ways because I really I didn't become a planner to plan. You know, I became a planner because I wanted to. You know, help to make the help to make the world a, a better place. And um, you know, if I get out of here in 20 years, I'd like to think some things have gotten better. So, is, so to follow up on this for the next meeting, should we should we be ready to do to jump into housing for the next meeting? Um, it certainly is a place to just just to start to review and get some understanding. I'm starting to pull some things together. I've gotten more time lately. Um, it's been kind of a challenging. Uh, winter, so we adopted the zoning January 3rd, and then right after that, had some stuff at home that I had to deal with that I'm now starting to get back um, to be able to spend more time at work. So it's, it's, this is what I've been actually working on, is revisions to this. Um, and I'll try to get more stuff as we get into our next meeting, which is March 12th. So that will be after town meeting day. So, and I mean, just we could have commission members think about. You could get in touch with Leslie if there's some like a housing issue you want to go into, and I think the brainstorming on various um, strategies for housing is. And maybe I'll talk to. I, I haven't had a chance to talk to um, our housing task force. And maybe I'll see about trying mm -hmm. to organize a meeting and see if we can get some of them to come to visit and meet with you guys. Yeah. Um, Kevin Casey, our community development specialist who kind of runs that program, uh, mm -hmm. had his baby two weeks ago. Oh. So he's been kind of out on paternity, so I'm a little bit short staffed in that area, but I think we could still bring pull them in to kind of have the discussion of stuff because they're going to be the first ones. They're kind of going to do the heavy lifting of coming up with um, their specific recommendations that they can bring to you, but I think it's also helpful for them to hear from you at the start as to what you guys think. Should we have a um, discussion first to make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of what we're working towards so that the work that any of these committees are doing is, is going to be helpful and not... Um, not seen. It won't, it won't be us basically tearing up what they've done because it's way too long and for a different format than moving towards. Yes, we should have some of those discussions up front. Um, with the committees. With the, yeah. They should yeah. come here and say, this is what we're thinking. Well, the committees are going to want to get into substance and have a lot of great ideas and I think part of what our job is mm -hmm. is to help guide them and help them prioritize so that we can pull things together and have a clearer picture for what to work, work mm -hmm. towards. I mean, you, you can pick up almost any plan in the state and you'll have a 300 page document with a lot of you know great ideas and great strategies but good luck figuring out where, um, where you should put your limited resources. Are you I think thinking I had a hard time doing it until I heard what the crazy ideas were. <laughs> are you, are I, you mean, I mean, you need, you need some background before you can give guidance. Well, he's, 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 
talking about giving them some guidelines to sort of make them more efficient, to make them more, in one way, right? And they, so it's not all about substance. It's about, we expect it to be about this long. We expect it to be about this format, like that yeah. kind of. Yeah, I think if they came in, uh, yeah, I think if we got, made sure they, they understood, they're eventually going to have to come back to a 2,000 word, six page thing, but they may have, if they want to do a 30 page white paper on, with the data analysis and all this other stuff, that's not going to go in the plan. That's just going to be a white paper that, if somebody is really that interested in reading. And some of it's just a common understanding of like, there's a room for throwing out, there's, there's definitely a place for throwing out a lot of ideas and we don't want to discourage that at all. Um, but we also don't want to make it seem, you know, we want them to have, be on the same page in terms of we're not going to be adopting a plan that has all of these ideas and let's work together to prioritize these. And then just the reality is that we know that these really long plans without real detailed implementation plans are not, yeah. not effective. Yeah. So are you thinking of one general message that we could send to all of the committees about what our expectations are and to work yeah. on that next time? I think that, okay. Yeah. And some of that needs to be what are what are our expectations or what do we want to work with? Mm -hmm. Now are they going to be doing public outreach? Is that going to be something we're doing? Is it happening at City Council? Um, What's I, within plan? within their context, I think they're going to be doing some. I think it depends on the committee and what they're working on. Mm -hmm. I don't expect a lot of public outreach from utilities and facilities and their right. their. Pieces. I think a lot of their stuff is to, you know, the, um, the capital budget committee would probably be doing a lot of that work. And, uh, but others, I think, really do need to get public input. I mean, mm -hmm. historic preservation is not going to come up with a historic plan without going back to the public and, and selling them on it. And mm -hmm. So should we be setting up expectations around that as well? Mm -hmm. yeah. To what extent they should be reaching out? I think there's outreach, and I think there's also going to be a little bit of, they're, they're providing drafts that I think ultimately you guys are going to be reviewing in, in, in the same way that you'll send it to council, and they may, may make changes. I think each committee needs to understand that there may be a certain amount that of drafts that they send to you guys that you guys are going to make changes to, because you guys are going to be looking at a much bigger picture. So while an energy committee may be focused on getting everybody out of their cars, you ultimately need to also go and look at the transportation plan that may be saying, you know, we can't do everything that you guys wanted. We have to balance this with our other goals. You know, um, natural resources may not be taking as much into consideration on economic development as, um, as you will and vice versa for economic development. When we do that plan, we're going to have to look at that in light of other issues. So they're not just getting a these are our plans and approve them and send them to council. I think um, there'll be an important piece that you'll have to take in weighing this in light of the other pieces. And the one thing that the discussion we had last time is some suggestion that the whole economics of development are going to change because nobody has to pay any taxes anymore. When we're doing the zoning, um, we had a few developers come to the Planning Commission. I went around and talked to a lot of people and figured out, you know, I read all this crap, but why aren't you building a house? No money. There's no money in it. There's no reason to do it. Um, so a certain amount of reality there are some things going on in the city. Uh, Dodd and his uh, downsizing group, which is an interesting group, that dis discovers desire or demand, but not much supply. But it's it's interesting. I think the whole tax. I don't like conventional wisdom. If I see an idea that's been kicking around since. I'd say maybe things have changed. We should have another look at why we're not getting housing. And, and 
what housing do we want? And I don't know how we get the economic data. Um, and Tim Heaney's always anxious to come in and tell us what to think, and I, I value his his comments. And I'm not a developer. I don't know what these people think about. Part of part of it is that. The economics are really important, but part of it across small town America is that there are there's no developer who's going to come here and you know start building things in uh, Montpelier or any of other you know, no big big Vermont's other big money isn't going to come here because they're not going to get it back. Um, but but so we need to be you know it, being a developer on a very small scale is not necessarily that hard. Start looking at. You know, we have a lot of really smart people in Montpelier who have some of the skill sets that are necessary to be a successful developer. Um, so how do we empower those people to start doing that? It could be you know, duplex or fourplex. You can get a mortgage for a single family home you know, on two sheets of paper. It's not that hard to do. I don't disagree with that. I'm just suggesting that the people who want to make money out of this are the people who've got to tell us what their problem is. Yeah. I would, I would say that if the same ideas are kicking around since 2014, it's probably because we haven't acted on many of them. And that's why the landscape hasn't changed, because I mean, I the same barriers continue to exist. When we were doing the zoning, I became convinced that the economics of what's going on is far more important than anything we put on paper. And I think planning is, I mean, 2008 has just rippled through the economy, and it's now we're doing something else. But uh, seven or eight years, we were recovering. Mm -hmm. Now we got a whole new tax law that frees up money. Um, Do you mean tits when you say that? What's that? Do you mean the tip district when you're talking no, about tax? No, no. I mean that if you're a small developer and you're a former corporation, you don't pay any taxes. Or virtually none, which is a pretty powerful incentive. Uncle Whiskers in Washington subsidizing development, not us. And I'd like to know more about that. I think that's a looming reality, and I think it has a lot to do with development, far more than the little rules and guidance that we put down. Well, I think that's what the housing committee's going to look at is the economics. I mean, in that was what I was trying to say with the zoning. It's as much as zoning as we do, that's, that may remove some barriers, that may put some encouragement in there, but ultimately I think um, we need to understand what the, the economic barriers are, because um, it costs, you know, 250 to 280,000 to build an apartment unit. So, you know, if you're looking at a quadplex, you're almost up to a million dollars for you know, that, you know, suddenly you've got to go and start seeing, well, how much am I going to have to get in rent in order to pay the mortgage to make that happen? Sure. And if the economics aren't there, people aren't going to build. And the question is, how can we put the thumb, put your thumb on the scale to help to lower those costs? Um, yeah. You know, that was what we did in Barry when we w wanted to get more economic development in Barry. We had to look at the fact that, you know, commercial rents were only getting, you know, 8 to 10, maybe $12 a square foot. To build some of these buildings, you'd have to be charging eighteen dollars a square foot to pay the mortgage. Yeah. So these projects aren't going to happen. So we did a TIF district and we did tax stabilizations because the tax stabilization saved almost four dollars a square uh, four dollars off on a square foot. So you know we started to be able to lower those costs to a point where, with new market tax credits and a, f a few other programs because it was a distressed area, we were able to, to put the thumb on the scale that let developers come in and invest and you know create the 500, 700 jobs that it did. 
it happens because we consciously put our thumb on the scale to, to try yeah. to make sure we understood it. And I think the same thing is going to have to happen with housing. We haven't had the chance to really start to say, okay, where can we, you know, we've got this money, that, that's what I said with the housing trust fund, can we find a way to make that money make things happen? You know, talk to homeowners, why haven't you put in an accessory apartment? Is it because you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how to actually go through the process of doing this? Maybe we could establish micro grants that we could use to bring in an architect that would lay out the money and go and say, you know, John, you can put in an accessory apartment. We'll put in the $5,000 to help plan for it and help you explain the economics of it and what it would cost to design it and what it would look like. And, you know, if you decide to go ahead and do it, then you owe that money back because you'd probably be able to charge and pay that back over three years five years or right. or not at all. This is 800 square feet. <laughs> 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 all right, maybe not your house, but, you know, we, we uh, but it's that, that idea that maybe if we could use these, uh, a, a micro grant, but we really have to, we, we have to look at what, why is it, you know, people have big houses and high taxes, why wouldn't they put in an accessory apartment? And we really just need to talk to the people and find out if we helped you by spending some of this this you know housing preservation money that's sitting idle if we can repurpose that we might be able to help people to put another accessory apartment in i think the the obvious answer for me um working on being a part person who studies policy and resources policy and uh for a day job the obvious answer then is that it's not easy enough for people i mean when people are not acting in a way in which they could, a rational person would do this to because it's just a boon. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not easy enough. Um, or is and, it and misinformation? People think it's this, and in fact, what we need to do is a better job of marketing and making people understand. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I'd never do that because I, I don't want tenants who are going to be this or that. It's like, well, okay, well now we've got to just educate people. What, it's, what it means to be a landlord, and, and it's not as scary or hard as it seems, and we have the resources to help educate you on how to be a good landlord if you're going to have, you know, a tenant living in your garage in an accessory apartment. Um, and being the city, being representative of the city, we're in charge of the hoops people have to jump through to get there, and making that as easy as possible. Yep, yep. You know, and that's, and that, that's less of less of an issue, but we do need to certainly keep an eye out for the barriers there. Um, but I think it's the other thing to keep in mind, um, just your comment there about you know, what we do, is, is also within this plan I've always tried to focus, and, and within here, is really what we as the city government do. Um, and to try to make sure we're, we're directing our resources towards, you know, um, nobody lives in a house owned by the city of Montpelier. It's all owned by our partners or landlords or private. So when we want to create housing, we aren't going to build any housing. We aren't creating anything. We're going to be providing incentives, things to help other people do things. So we ha always have to kind of make sure we're writing and recognizing that's what we're doing. Um, it's working with our partners, making those types of things happen. And I think that's, 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 so that's my, you've got to, you know, that's a little bit of my brain and how I, I'm hoping this goes and that over the next couple of years we can put together some really good plans, whether it's complete streets, whether it's housing, whether it's energy, that we really can put together a nice plan that helps um, set a good direction because I think there are a lot of goals. This is a very progressive and I think a lot of people in the community, a lot of things they want to try to see us be net zero, have complete streets, good biking and walking. Um, and I think each one of those just needs a good plan and a good strategy to how to, um, how to implement that plan we'll start making progress. Okay, so um, we'll keep moving. We're not, we didn't really have that ambitious of an agenda tonight, so no reason to, to stay really late. Uh, so to move things along, just to kind of cap off that conversation, we'll, uh, we'll talk to Leslie about getting on the agenda next week. Um, uh, something where we're going to frame our expectations for the committees and Based on what we talked about tonight, Mike, would it be possible to have some a draft kind of I don't know if instructions is the right word, but some 
framework of our expectations. Framework is. Um, trying to think. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I think what we would talk about next time would be what would be our expectations. Would it, would it help? I think it would help people to have if we have like because I think imagine this being like a paragraph or not a lot more than that, right? Yeah, or I don't know if there's like an example table or template for a particular. Oh, for what a chapter might ultimately end up being six or eight pages, and where we eventually okay. yeah. go way out and collect up all this stuff, but eventually going to funnel it into. So some kind of written framework for us to look at, then we'll discuss, and then talk about how what we want to add and subtract it from that. So, but, but with the goal of having it ready to be kind of worked on next week and then for us to pass out next week and to get onto the committee so they can start getting their work going. And I think to some degree it's, it's a framework of not just what the final document should look like, but how they should be thinking about it. So if we want to say, well, what do we, what do we want to see in this area where the goals we're looking at, where the barriers we might run into, and what sort of resources does the city have? Like those are the three, that's the, how I'm looking at it. So within each of these areas, if they're doing those things, then at the end, they'll get some sort of document that looks some specific way. And I think what's more important is to set up that initial, how they should be thinking about it framework. Yeah, and uh, also just what our, uh, I messaged kind of, I don't know, explaining how of what our expectations are and how you know, we're grateful for their work and support and we'll be going back and just because we throw out an idea doesn't mean it's a good one. Or, I don't know. I hope we can just communicate to them early on that we're all partners in this and don't take anything personally. Um, I've just seen processes where Committees work in silos. They send everything mm -hmm. over, and then they, they, everyone is fighting to keep it what they, what mm -hmm. they came up with, and hoping that's not. Yeah, yeah. and I've seen it the other way where planning commissions will develop all this stuff in their own silo without input from them, and the transportation or the energy committee goes, "This is well, that's not our plan. We didn't develop it." Yeah, and I think part of that might be for the committees if they if they want someone from the planning commission to be attending their meetings so that they can be a liaison in these meetings or whenever we're talking mm -hmm. about that section they can come and be a part of that so we're making sure that that's that we're encouraging that back it's a really good thing to include yeah, yeah. so like an open invitation basically so yeah. setting up that expectation that this is doing this yeah. together um, so that's something for next week also would would it would it be possible to have someone from the housing task force at the next meeting do you want to talk first among um, amongst ourselves about this framework before we meet with them, or do you want to try to have somebody? I wasn't sure where we by. landed. What did, what what other people think about? Is it, is it important to go ahead and start if a conversation with the next with the meeting? I, if it's not the next meeting, I would have them at the at the following. So I mean, the, the question would be whether we have them at the twelfth, or whether we ask them to show up on the twenty sixth. I would say the next one, just to set up the framework and then make yeah. sure that we know. We have, well, at least know who's on the council by then. I don't know. We don't have any input from them yet. But mm -hmm. the other things to talk about. I don't see any downside in going ahead and talking to the housing task force. Is that what you're, is that what you're suggesting? I'm, I'm saying we might have other things to talk about before we actually meet with them to figure out this framework. But Yeah, I think that'll, the, okay. this might take so we'll, us we'll the wait. better part of housing, it. Housing task force meeting. tentatively for the 26th. Yeah. Okay. okay. And I'll, I'll talk with them. I think they've got a meeting. I'll, I'll find out what their schedule is and I'll meet with them. I'm actually is not going to be at the next meeting, but I would put a plug in for also if there's any sort of outside of the separate topic areas, if there's any higher level outreach we want to do ahead of time or any visioning we want to get from presidents or anything like that, it would be good to talk through that. So it's not just siloed within each group. If there's something bigger we should be doing, that would be good to talk about. I mean, a little bit of what, just, just to give you a little bit of background of, of how we framed this with the council in the past was that the 350 people and the 50 public input sessions and the everything that there was a lot of visioning that went into this. I think we obviously still need to go back and get input to kind of refresh and make sure that, I mean, it's almost 10 years old, um, going on 10 years old now. So 
um, we do need to make sure that that vision is still accurate. But there had been a lot of kind of that visioning that had been done, um, and I think revisiting it isn't isn't bad. But I don't know if we would necessarily get in and do another. So maybe it's checking. If really that's still big. Valid instead yeah. Of just starting over. Told council we were going to go back and open up Envision Montpelier again. I think we'd all be run out. But I think it's still a good check in to see if that's still mm -hmm. the right vision. I think uh, there's no shortage of resources. I mean, there's a lot of these issues have been looked at by previous plans and things. And yeah, we I think we should absolutely look at all of those things going into each of the different sections for the plan. So you guys, okay. So it looks like we, we know what we're going to going to do. Um, so with that, we'll move on to the next item, which is to consider the minutes from February 12th and for January 22nd. Do, do we have the January? No, uh, be approved. I put one of each over there. Um, Do we have a motion? I'll second. <laughs> John. Um, so the, okay. the interesting part about February 12th is that it wasn't actually, oh, it actually was a meeting. So we did end up put, no, nope, we, we only ended up with three yeah. people there. Yeah. We didn't have a quorum. So yeah. we did not have a quorum, so those are more just, I think we'll notes. technically approve them, but they're more notes than minutes. Right. Okay. January 22nd, uh, I'll make a separate motion to approve January 22. Second. Okay. That was fair. I don't know if I can vote on that so that we have a quorum. Uh, I think te technically yeah. you don't yeah. have to be present yeah, we'll, to vote on we'll, them. Oh, we'll, okay. we'll, yeah, we'll but. just leave February 12 alone because that wasn't an official meeting for that forum. Um, and then so with January, January 22nd, we have a motion. Um, well, I ask you to vote for the motion. This is my first time. <laughs> you think after all of the times that I've heard it? <laughs> aye. All those in favor say aye. All those in favor say aye. That's aye. pretty easy to remember. Aye. That's how you do it. Okay. Any opposed? Any opposed? Any abstain? I guess I'll abstain for January. I could tell you were yeah. struggling. With, uh, we will officially get a 4 out vote anyway, so. So I'm going to adjourn. Second. And that's, uh, Kevin, John, to adjourn. That's pretty okay. good.